Okay. Hey fam, it's your girl, Miss Diva Trucker, and I am coming to you again today. And the topic that I wanted to discuss with you all today is going to be about um, trucking terminology, uh, transportation terminology, and also um, equipment, types of, of equipment. And this is for people that are looking to become dispatchers, uh, looking to become agents, or even looking to open your own brokerage, okay? If you are in the, uh, first of all, let me just say, how are you doing? Okay, Alfonso, let me ask you this. Can you hear me? Just make sure that you can hear me and see me. Hello, peace and blessings to you. Thank you. Uh, let me know if you can hear me. Am I coming through clear? No audio. Okay. Uh, 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 Let me see. Hold on one second. Let me check the audio. Hello, hello. Okay, I can hear it on my part. Okay, so uh, uh, Alfonso, you can hear me, right? Yes, and I'll get started. How you doing? Okay, I can hear you from uh, Facebook Live. Okay, good. Um, Sharon, can you hear me now? It may take a moment, but we should be good. And I'll get started. Um, I'm doing these videos for people that um, want to be a dispatcher, freight agent, or broker. Um, hey, Melvin. It was me. Okay. Okay. So um, this is what I'm doing for free. You don't have to pay for it. Okay. But you can use the information if you're thinking that you want to get into this industry. Okay. So as a dispatcher, as a broker, as an agent, a freight agent, some of the things that you are going to need to know before you start moving a load is we're going to work on transportation terminology what it means and also we're going to work on the equipment the type of equipment that you would need hey highway exec um the uh type of equipment that you will need to know about when you're wanting to call your shippers uh to move their loads okay you need to know the type of equipment that uh it needs to take to move that that product whatever it is okay so if you're in those type of fields that's what we're going over today um and if you are a driver and you already are, or uh 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 in the trucking business you probably already know these uh terminologies but if you're not and you're completely on the outside this is all going to be new to you okay so before you even start making a call before you start reaching out to shippers you got to know what equipment it is that you want to work with okay so that's what we're going to go over today um i have a broker manual uh, that I post in the uh, group so people can look at it as well and learn on their own. But right now I'm getting ready to share my screen and we can get into it. And also guys, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask me about it. Okay. Um, and we'll go through it. We're going to be on here for about an hour, hopefully. Okay. And I hope that you get something out of it. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about equipment types. Okay. Um, as a agent, as a broker, as a dispatcher, you got to know what you're working with. Do you, are you working with a carrier that has a dry van, reefer, a hot shot, um, box truck, uh, step deck, flatbed, those type of things you would need to know, okay? Um, so the different types of equipment, if you've never been in trucking, um, we're going to go over the, those, okay? We have dry bed, flatbed, you have air ride logistics, um, it, and you have your axles on your flatbed. They could be a two or three axle. Some of them will have ramps on them. So you have different types of flatbed um, 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 equipment that you can use. Okay. 
some people are real sticklers about the equipment that they need. Um, and some people will be optional. Like they will say to you, okay, uh, it could be a van or a reefer. Okay. Um, it can be a flatbed or a step deck. Okay. Um, it just depends on a shipper and what kind of product that they have. Okay. So also you have your light specialty trucks, which are your light specialty equipment, which are your hot shot equipment. Okay. And that is going to depend on the length and the weight. Okay. And the weight is going to depend on um, whether you need a CDL or not. Okay. To carry these equipment, because if it's under a certain, uh, if it weighs under a certain amount, then you don't have to have a CDL. Okay. Um, the reefer trailer, that's everything that we have that uh, you need to have refrigerated. Think of anything that is in your refrigerator right now. Uh, think of anything that is in your freezer, anything that has to be at a temperature on it, or the product will go bad. You will need a reefer trailer. Okay. Um, to be able to transport those goods. All right. When you're thinking about driving, you're thinking about products that don't need refrigeration. So if you go into Home Depot, there's a load of products in Home Depot that don't need refrigeration. OK, but if you're thinking about Walmart, there's a load of products that, you know, you're going to need a refrigerator. You're going to be going to their distribution centers. OK, um, let's see. So let me see if I can go into this in detail. They are uh, flatbed. You have your hot shot. You have your reefer trailer. You have your also you have your double drop decks. OK, you have your dollies. All right. That will connect the trailers as well. You also have heavy haul trailers. Some will have nine axles on them, 11 axles, 12 axles. So there's different types of equipment. And if you're not sure, you can always ask your shipper, what kind, what type of equipment do you want? When you're getting over into heavy haul and things like that, you're going to need, see, it's, it says right here, dimensions may apply. What's going to be important is you're going to need to know the height and how much it comes over that trailer, because you're going to need to know if you're going to need either a pilot cars behind you to help you move that load, or if you're going to have to put flags out because it's so much over the trailer where it's considered um, oversized freight. Okay. You're going to need to know those things. Okay. So before you even make a phone call and you're picking up calling your shipper, study and make sure that you know your different types of trailers. Okay. You have your RGN expandable double drop deck to axle. This is where you get into maybe the more experience um, portion of, and especially like when you're a carrier. So if you're a carrier, right, and you want to get into heavy haul, or you want to get into some of these uh, more uh, gooseneck and all that kind of stuff, these trail, this stuff like right here. Sometimes they have levels to it. So for instance, they'll train you on like regular flatbed trailers where you can go out there, you can tarp and you can chain and uh, you can use your uh, straps and things like that. That's maybe like level one in flatbed. Okay. But then it goes up in levels and every level that you go up, you have to be certified in that level. So you will be able to move that type of equipment. Normally, if you're just getting into flatbed, they're not going to let you move um, this uh, RGN trailer, a uh, heavy haul, all that kind of stuff. You have to move so many like regular flatbed trailers before you get into the oversized and a heavy haul equipment. Okay. Um, reefer truck, reefer, refrigerator. You got a uh, Bulbo and the refrigerated trucks have this refrigeration on there. Another thing you will notice about this truck, it, it has a, it has its own fuel. Okay. So if you are a driver or a uh, agent or a broker or whatever the case may be, you always got to make sure that when you're moving refrigerated loads, it has to stay at the temperature that uh, the, it has to stay at the temperature. Um, it's in the group. Uh, I don't sell this manual, but the whole thing is, this thing is like 72 pages. So it's in a um, mentorship group where you can view it 
however you want to, right? So then you would be able to, um, it's, it's a uh, refrigerator on the uh, trailer, okay? You got this uh, fuel thing here that you fill up with reefer fuel, okay? And you have to make sure that you maintain that uh, uh, temperature, okay? It could be frozen where it's ice cream, where it's like negative uh, 20, 10 degrees or uh, chicken or whatever the case may be. If that temperature is above or below what the shipper requires it to be, you can have a claim, okay? You can have damaged product, damaged goods. A lot of times it will happen with things like bananas, Okay, they have to have a certain temperature and they check it and make sure. So also, what will happen like if something uh, your driver gets there or the carrier gets there, your broker and something happens and they, the shipper refused the product, the whole truckload of product. Where are you going to take a truckload of bananas to? when somebody doesn't want them, right? You gotta be able to get it off the truck. So at that time, um, your company or the broker or the shipper will have an alternate location where you can take that product. And sometimes they will sell it to like a wholesale company that will sell it and they will get it. They may not get all the money that they wanted for the product, but they will be able to recoup some kind of profit from that load. So it's not totally destroyed. Okay. Sometimes if you're in refrigeration as well, they um, reject the load. You don't have anywhere to take it. Sometimes they will require you to take it back to the shipper or they will tell you to do something like dispose of the product. OK, so when they tell you to dispose of the product, then you as a carrier has the option to, you know, throw it in the trash or whatever the case may be. They ask you to take pictures so they can have for insurance purposes, OK, to get reimbursed for the 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 cargo that was lost okay so that's what usually refrigerated uh trucks uh had trailers do okay now when you're a dispatcher or a broker or whatever the case may be when you're dealing with refrigerated freight uh, a lot of times you're going to deal with detention okay a lot of times you're going to deal with early appointments maybe two in the morning, three in the morning, okay? Um, you're going to hear this uh, reefer trailer in the back while you're trying to sleep all the time, okay? Some people can't even sleep with that reefer going. Um, you always got to check the temperature. You always got to be alert on these loads because any wrong thing, these loads can go bad, right? And you don't want that because it's going to cause a claim. So when you're picking out and you're new, that's why I say start with driving first. And then as you get your experience and, and move up, you may want to get with refrigerated because you got to make sure that when you're doing your agreements with your shipper, okay, when you do your shipper uh, packs with the shipper, you got to make sure you account for any times that uh, the driver may be there over a certain period of times. Usually they like to do two hours, okay? And you got to put that in your agreement. My, my carrier is going to get paid $50 an hour after $75, whatever the case may be, if they have to be there more than two hours, okay? Um, and that's what you got to worry about with refrigerated detention uh, time. You may have layover time on refrigerated. Um, you also, and, and, and there's really not, like nothing you can do. Okay. So now also with refrigerated reefer trucks, they're going to be either 48 or 53 feet long. We usually deal with 53 foot trucks. That's what the shipper mostly asks for. They want a 53 foot truck. Okay. The inside of the trailer is usually about 98 inches wide. Okay. Um, this is a, a refrigerated trailer. Let's put it down a little bit so we can maybe see all of it. It's a refrigerated trailer commonly referred to as reefer. So when you hear somebody say um, reefer trailer or whatever the case may be, we're not talking about like reefer and uh, um, um, like 
with marijuana or drugs or anything like that. We're talking about reefer because it's shortened for refrigerated. That's the term that we use uh, in transportation to um, refer to the refrigerated trailer. All reefer vans small has a small door opening in the back. Okay, um, uh, doors in the in at the front and the rear of the trailer to use uh, to vent the refrigerated gases out of the trailer while in transport. Okay, also you can open the back of those doors as well, so you could stick like a pump uh, a reader thing in there to check to make sure that your load or what's in there is maintaining that temperature. Okay. Uh, let's see. In some instances, a reefer van can be substituted as a dry van with the refrigeration unit off. OK, sometimes people will get refrigerated units. And if they get in an area where they don't get a refrigerated load to come out of, they will uh, find a dry van load. And if that shipper say, I don't care, it could be it can go in a dry van trailer. Um, then uh, all you have to do is just turn your reefer off and run it as dry band. I've done that several times with several, you know, different companies that will take either or. And on the low board, you will see it listed as V slash R. Sometimes you will see it listed as V slash R slash uh, for flatbed, either or. They don't care. They could put it on a reefer trailer. They could put it on a, a flatbed trailer or they could put it in a dry band trailer. They really not, um, they don't care about what trailer you use, okay? Uh, Insulated the walls. All right, let's move on from reefer trailer. Refrigerator, when you're thinking about reefer and you're thinking about um, being a freight agent or a broker and you want to go after refrigerated loads, you're going to be thinking about produce. You're going to be thinking about everything that goes into ice cream, Um and when you're doing those type of loads, you also want to make sure that you have the insurance, okay? As a broker, when you're a broker, uh, a lot of times or sometimes um, shippers will require you to have what is called contingent cargo. Contingent cargo kicks in after you go through the carrier's uh, insurance company. And for whatever reason, if you made a mistake that you didn't make sure that you vetted your carrier, that they had the proper insurance, then they're going to come after the broker on contingent cargo. Okay. If you sign up with FEMA, you're going to notice that if you are a broker and you sign up with FEMA to move uh, FEMA loads, you have to carry $300,000 in contingent cargo. Okay. That's mandatory with the government as a broker. Okay. And also the carrier is going to have their uh, cargo insurance as well. Okay. Now you get that. Let's go down to a uh, drive in. Okay. Everybody with me so far, you got any questions? Just let me know. And those of you that are not you know, here right now, you could catch it on the replay, play it back later. You could play it back as many times as you want until you understand about all the trailers. OK, so this one right here is a driving trailer. OK, um, nothing too fancy. You know, it will store things like uh, Clorox. Uh, it will store uh, potato chips. Um, it will store um um uh plants it can it can store oh hey jason it can store all kinds of things uh that does not need laptops uh electronics uh tires you know all those different things go into a dry band trailer okay now usually the weight let's go back up here to refrigerate it okay usually the weight on refrigerated is not going to go any higher than 40 44 thousand OK, that's going to be about the heav heaviest because you're going to have to account for this thing right here, the reefer, all that other kind of stuff to make sure that you're not over 80,000 pounds. OK, um, in a dry van, a dry van can go a little bit more up in weight. Sometimes you will see those at the heaviest at 45,000. OK, because they don't have the refrigeration on it and they don't have the uh, reefer, uh, the uh, fuel on there. Okay, so drive van trailers again, 
they're going to be 48 to 53. Usually we work with 53 foot trailers, okay? Um, these are unrefrigerated trailers, commonly referred as dry band. Typical weight can be 46 to 48. I usually, I don't load anything over 45, okay? Because you're you just running a high chance of being overweight, okay? Usually 48 for my flatbed, but 45 on a dry van. Okay, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't load a, a driving a trailer of forty eight thousand pounds. That would be flatbed. Okay, but real simple, um, real simple with the dry van. Either you got refrigeration or not. Either you need it cooled or not. Uh, one thing that you do have to have on your bill bill laden when you're riding in a reefer trailer is you must have the temperature uh, listed on the BOL. Okay. So let's go down to another trailer. Okay, you may recognize this trailer. This is just a flatbed trailer. Okay, it's an open deck. Okay, um, this trailer is flatbed. Okay, 48 feet long. Uh, they also could be as long as 53 feet, depending on what the shipper requires. Okay, um, some of our trailers, few and far between, can be up to 53 feet. Um, same as the uh, inches, 102 inches wide, um, whatever. So a flatbed load will often require you to either tarp the load from the wind, rain, snow, salt, road, road debris, or and you will have to also strap the load to put straps on it to secure it, okay? Um, and if hauling steel coils, coil racks, okay, the typical weight limit on the um, flatbed is going to be 48,000 pounds, okay? Now, if you're a driver, you, some, you know all this stuff, you know, especially if you've been out there in a long time. So I'm basically not saying, talking to you all, I'm talking to people that's interested in becoming dispatchers, freight agents, or brokers. They have to know this information before you can even move a freight, any freight, okay? You got to know your trailer types, all right? So you'll see your um, Peterbilts and you see your flatbed. So you see this trailer, it's a regular flatbed trailer, Okay. If you look at this trailer, it has a little dip in it, right? So what do they call that kind of trailer? They call that a step deck. And that's the easiest to remember is that you can step up, okay? It's got a little step in between. It's real simple. It's a little bit lower sometimes to the ground, okay? And um, a drop deck called drop deck, step deck, 48 feet long. This trailer has two decks, okay? It has an upper deck and a lower deck. And many times you will see the rear of the trailer come back up to the, to the front, to, to the, of the front. I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, it's usually 11 feet long, okay? It drops down 18 inches, okay, uh, to the rear of the lower deck, okay? Why do they have step decks and drop decks? Because if you're carrying, like, the the big maybe generators or big uh, 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 tractors or things like that, and you put it at maybe the regular flatbed le level, it may be higher than the truck. Okay, higher than a truck, and and it won't go through the bridge, um, which is thirteen six most bridge on the highway or anything like that. It's thirteen six, so if it, it'll be higher up. So if you lower that deck down and you put the equipment on there, then therefore it can you know fit through the the um, the bridges and things like that. Okay, so step decks. When you are getting flatbed loads, uh, these will be stuff like uh, lumber. Um, it could be coals. It could be um, 
um, um, uh, tractors, you know, heavy equipment. It could be generators. It can be roofing supplies. It could be all kinds of things for a flatbed and step deck. It's just an open deck, okay? And they usually secure it by chains, tarp, straps, okay? Whatever they can to secure it to the bed of the truck, okay? Generators, um, um, all kind of air conditions, you know, those type of things, okay? Um, these uh, flatbed and step deck usually pay a little bit more than what dry band and reefer does because sometimes it's a little bit more work, okay? Uh, sometimes you may have to put oversized uh, stickers on it, things like that, okay? So you would know if you're working with a customer that strictly does flatbed and step decks uh, and uh, things like that, you would know that. They will tell you, okay? And then if, just ask. Make sure you ask, okay? Uh, type of hauling capacity is going to be 48,000 pounds, okay? Now let's go on down. This is what is called a double. Hey, Michael. This is what is called a double drop trailer, okay? So when I'm talking to you about equipment, that's why you have to learn the basics first when you get into being a freight agent, a dispatcher, or a broker, okay? You got to learn the uh, basics. You got to learn the terminology of these things because when you're on the phone with the shipper and you don't know, they're going to automatically assume that you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're doing. And it's least likely they're going to uh, give you any type of their freight, especially when it comes to uh, double drop trailers, step deck trailers, heavy hauling. OK, now this is something that you work up to. It makes more money. You receive more money, but you work to that. You don't just automatically go in because you have to do dimensions. You got to know the height, the size. You know, you may have to have all these other special permits and things like that. OK, don't worry yourself with all of that right now. If you're just getting in, get your foot in the door. Let's move some loads. Let's get some customers. OK. <laughs> Let's get some customers and then we'll go after all of this later on once you're established and you're making money, right? Okay, so some double drop deck trailers also are RGNs, removable goosenecks, okay? A RGN, y'all see those gooseneck trailers as well? Um, they all, they typically can carry all of them up to 48,000, okay? Um, and um, the shipper will know, uh, uh, can I just have a regular flatbed? They'll tell you, okay? So don't worry about that. Now, have y'all ever seen this trailer that uh, is a flatbed trailer and they have a inside closed, it looks like a dry van trailer, but what they call this is a Conestoga trailer, okay? That means that it, it has a flatbed, and this right here helps them uh, so they won't have to tarp the load, okay? Um, this usually, uh, it can haul heavy loads and it can haul approximately 70,000 pounds side of the roof, side back. OK, you still have to uh, uh, strap it or chain it or whatever down to the bed, but you usually wouldn't have to tarp this low because it already got the cover on it. OK. All right. Let's do this. Now, when we get to the. Uh, When we get to the limit of the trailer and the weight of the trailer, from steer axle to drive axle to tandems, okay? Now, your steers are always going to be the first two tires. Those are your steers, okay? The drive axle and on your steers, you can have up to 12,000 pounds on your steers, okay? On your drive axle, it's going to be 34,000 pounds, okay? Okay? That's your second set of tires. On your tandems, it's going to be 
34,000 pounds. When you add 12, 34, and 34, you're going to get 80,000 pounds. That is the maximum that you can carry on the highway without being overweight, okay? Anytime you go to a waist scale or um, um, a cat scale, and you go in that cat scale, and at the end or at the bottom of that number, it says 82,000, okay? It's highly unlikely that you will be able to fix 82,000. OK, now, if you go over here and this is twelve thousand, let's just say the, the middle number, the drive axle is saying thirty six thousand. OK, and then the tandem axle is saying twenty seven thousand. OK, you can fix that long as at the end of the day, it says eighty thousand pounds or less. You are um, within legal limit. OK. Um, you always want to balance out your weight, all right? So that's why we have tandems. Tandems are these right here, these axles right here, and they slide up and back, okay? And the way how you uh, uh, measure your load is sometimes you'll have little small holes, which are like 250 pounds, or you'll have the bigger holes, which is like 500 pounds, okay? New drivers get this confused a lot, and it's very simple. All you got to do is do 12, 34, 34, okay? And that is 80. If you are over here, you're going to lift it up or move it front or back, okay? And you always move what? Towards the problem. OK, so if your problem is 36, you're going to move these tandems up, OK, to alleviate that weight. If your problem is back here and the tandems are up here, you're going to move it back. OK, a trailer deck with a 10 foot spread can be rearranged loads better to make it have a smoother drive while you're driving down the highway. OK, because they can put 40 K on the 10 foot spread if closed group 34k on the rears okay um i'm talking about the rear tandems on the trailer okay these are your tandems i did not know what tandems was until i actually got out on the truck with my trainer and he kept saying you got to move your tandems you got to move your tandems i didn't have a clue what he was talking about right and uh all of a sudden he got out the truck and he was like, you pull this thing, you move it up, and then show me that way. But I had already got license, been on the truck with the man, and I'm out here riding. He talking about moving tandems. I had no clue what he was talking about or what it meant, okay? But it's easy. If you're over on your drives, you're going to what? Move towards the problem, right? So you're going to move back because you're going to move the tires up. If you're over there, you're going to move front because you need to move the tires back. Always think, I'm moving towards my problem. OK, to fix it. All right. Oh, let's see. Uh, so a 10 foot spread can pull away with more weight than a closed group trailer. OK, now on flatbeds, they have some some uh, tires that I think don't move or they only move a certain amount. OK, this is more like for flatbed. This is another um, example of a curtain band trailer. You know, keep the product from getting um, uh, uh, wet due to uh, weather. Okay. Then you have what is called intermodal. Okay. So it's a lot, guys. You have to learn a lot when you're getting in this field um, of what and what what kind of specialty that you want to be in. You don't want to be all over the place, okay? You either want to make it a model your specialty and deal with um, the rails or um, the ports, okay? Um, and, and work with that. You want to make dry band your specialty, make something a niche and then expand out that way, okay? In a model, meaning more than one mode of transportation. It's either coming by ship rail or truck or any combo okay unimodal is one mode of, of transportation okay this is where you're getting into your containers through the ports okay now let me ask you this how does freight and cargo get moved um the, in the air and on ship okay and rail how does it get who does that okay 
um, that's not going to be your regular freight broker or your uh, freight agent. They call these people that's in charge of moving freight from overseas by water, by air, or by rail. A lot of times they're going to be what you call freight forwarders. Okay. And that's a whole different license. Okay. Because you have to deal with um, 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 customs and um, learning what can go and what happens if your um, freight that you sent from China or came from China arrives here. And what if the vegetables or whatever is not okay to enter the United States? Okay. People who deal with that type of freight on water, air, and rail, okay, or what is called a freight forwarder. Now, where we step in as a freight broker, we will go and get the container from the port and take it to the customer, okay? So we go as a freight broker, we can go down there to the port, um, make arrangements, go get that chastity, and bring it over to the customer. Okay. It's all a part of logistics. We all got, it's like a circle. We all do our part. Okay. So you have the carrier that does their part by taking a truckload from either from warehouse to warehouse or warehouse to customer. You have the intermodal that will maybe take it from the port to the customer. It's called door to door service. Okay. You also have, um, 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 shipments that come in by air or leave by air okay we could pick it up from the customer in the united states and take it out to the port so it can go overseas okay but we have a lot more we import a lot more stuff okay um what slows it down when everything is when everybody is doing their part in the circle of logistics the carrier does their part they pick up the freight they deliver it to the customer when they hey arshan um, when they are doing their part, you know, that's one part of, of the, the circle, okay? When the broker and the agent are doing their part, they're working with the uh, shipper, the manufacturer, the person, the people that are making it, or the 3PL, 3PL. They have a part to make sure that they make the arrangement. A freight broker, freight agent, they make arrangement for the freight, okay, to go from one place to another, all right? Then you have your freight forwarders. They're... Um, making arrangements and doing the logistics from things that are coming from out the country or going out the country, okay? Air air or water, okay? Um, we as a carrier, we don't deal with, we, you know, we're not dealing with, we just deal with the 48 states. We don't deal with uh, things that go out the country or come in. We'll pick it up once it makes it here and we will take it to the door of the customer, okay? Uh, any questions? Hold on one second. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, let's get back to it. Um, do you know any companies that are hiring um, up and coming entry level agents? Yes, um, uh, we put on new agents that take the class, but in order to be on the, um, there's a lot of people, JB, everybody has brokerages. Um, um, but a lot of them want you to have your book of business before they will take you on. Okay. But there are smaller 
brokerages that you can work with so you can build your uh, book of business. Um, let me see. Hello, I think any suggestions on hauling pallets on Sprinter van as an independent carrier? De uh, Denise, that is, um, um, it's a good business to be in. I just don't know about the pallets. But you can make good money um, um, doing that as as a field, like picking them up. Um, um, there's a pallet company right down the street. You can also use it as a Sprinter van. You can pick it up. It's just contacting the customers because everybody, um, a lot of customers like their pallets to be uh, moved, you know, or taken somewhere or um, especially the damaged ones that need to be fixed. But I really didn't get into like pallet. I would call for them, um, you know, like if a shipper needs uh, pallets, we would do a truckload. So I deal with truckloads, okay? Because you have TL, which is a truckload. You have LTL, which is less than a truckload. You got to put loads together to get a final uh, uh, thing. But when you're first getting into it, deal with truckloads. Another thing you could do, Denise, is also check with some of the furniture companies, right? Um, and uh, you can get like little smaller contracts from them and um, be able to pick up stuff in uh, Sprinter vans and have them, you know, delivered um, locally or whatever the case may be. I think they call that uh, final mile. Uh, those are some things that you can do, but it's a lot of things that you can do with a Sprinter van. I just don't, you know, I just don't, it's not like my specialty. I deal, my specialty is full truckload. I deal with drive-in, refrigerated, and flatbed. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, let me see. Okay. So let's go with, uh, let's do the, um, how long I've been on 47 minutes. Okay. Let's do the, um, Seven steps of assess uh, to successful brokering. All right. What are your duties? Understand the need and desires of both shipper and motor carrier. One of the biggest items of importance for shipper is cost. Okay. You want to be, um, you want big companies employ entire logistic departments to find the most effective route and method to move their cargo. Some large shippers uh, use their own trucks, some use freight brokers, and some allow their customers to uh, arrange for transportation, okay? Smaller shippers re rely more upon freight brokers to move their cargo, but large companies, large shippers have costs at the top or close to the top of their priorities, okay? So when I'm telling you, um, when I'm saying to you, find a lot of small shippers because they are more likely to work with a freight broker or a freight agent when you're first getting in, okay? Larger shippers have bigger needs that you may not have the capacity for, okay? But you'll get there, okay? Once you're building up your carrier database, um, and also larger shippers may not want you brokering off their freight. They usually hire what is called a 3PL, third-party logistics. Okay, let's see. Do you know what company have a school you can go to? Yes. If First thing you do, Paul, is make sure that you get your permit, okay? And then when you get your permit, then look for schools in your area, okay? Now, um, depending on if you have tickets or you have a felony, um, it's going to base on what school you can go to, okay? A lot of the big schools are your SWIFT, your CR Englands, your KLLM, your Prime, um, those type of schools, okay? They also have private schools where you can, if you don't have a job, um, you can maybe qualify under the state program and they will pay for you to go to, to, to school locally, okay, to get your CDL, okay? So you do have a lot of options. Search CDL schools in your area and see what comes up. Apply for them, see what the qualifications are, 
And uh, if you need something that you don't have money to pay for up front, go to a sponsored school. Okay. Be, par- be prepared to be gone. If you're leaving out of state, be prepared to be gone about three to four months, four to six months. You're going to be gone a while. It's going to take you a month to even get your CDO. Okay. Uh, depending on how you go fast, how you go fast through it. Okay. It's going to take longer if you don't have your permit. Okay. You're going to have to be on a truck with a trainer for four to six weeks. If you go to prime, uh, expect to be on that truck for at least four months. Okay. Prime pays the highest, but they have the longest training. All right. They're a good company. They're going to uh, cater to your every need. Okay, you're going to have washer and dryers, you're going to have beds that you can sleep in, you're going to have showers, you're going to have the whole nine yards, okay? Um, But they're going to keep you for a long time in training, all right? Um, But you can play video games and pool, uh, ping pong and basketball, so you'll have something to entertain you. Um, Let me see. Uh, Number two, understand that The freight broker needs to negotiate a win-win situation whereby everyone achieves the goal, the shipper, the carrier, and the freight broker, okay? You want your shipper to be happy, you want your carrier to be happy, and you want to be able to make money as well. Hold on, y'all. We don't get through this. I'm back. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. You got to be able to so that everybody to get everybody um, has a win-win situation. Okay. Um, the best negotiators are ones that you're going to make your uh, a carrier, you're going to make your shipper happy. You're going to make your carrier happy and you're going to make, you know, take a portion of that. Okay. And long as everybody is not trying to be greedy, then we all make money. Okay, a lot of times where these big brokerages, they have so much overhead that they can't afford to cut, you know, or whatever the case may be. And the shipper is not willing to go higher because they may can't afford to go higher. Okay, so when you come in as a small and you don't have a lot of overhead, you can add more value. Okay, where you can move it and you can give that savings to your carrier, and also you're able to make a decent amount of money. Okay, that's why independent agents or uh, brokers that don't have large brokerages, there are opportunities out there for you. Okay, everybody can't afford to pay CR England rate. Okay, Um, uh, CR England. Uh, C.H. Robinson rate, okay, and then they have a limit or they have a um, a, a threshold that they have to meet in order to stay in business, okay? They got to look out for themselves before they, you know, look out for the carrier, okay? So, uh, so that could stay afloat, right? Um, so, 
pay attention to that. Being able to negotiate, know what the market, uh, know what the market can handle, and what the rate is going for, and don't be afraid to ask for more. Okay, don't be afraid to ask for more. Um, the problem I have is as a flat bay owner operator with my own authority, some of these smaller freight brokers don't get approved by my factoring company. Okay. Um, the freight, the, the smaller freight brokers don't get approved by your factoring company. Yeah, you may and see when you're factoring, um, you may have a factoring that all the bills have to go through. Uh, your factoring company, right? So they kind of got you in a bind where um, they may be a good freight uh, broker, but they don't have a rating yet or they're new. And it's only to protect you when you're with that factoring company, okay? Because there's so many uh, brokers out there, unknown brokers, and they may seem, you know, good on paper. And then when it comes to payment, they don't pay. OK, but yeah, that is um, that is with the the about the with the factoring company. They may have had an issue um, with them before. Like sometimes I want to work with some shippers. Right. And I can't work with that shipper, even though they seem to be a nice shipper. They're going to give me freight. I can't work for that shipper because they may have had a problem in the past or they're not good at paying their bills. When you have a factoring company, they uh, they want their money within a certain period of time. And if you have been a broker that is not paying in that certain period of time, they're not going to want you to work for that broker. It's a protection for you as the carrier. All money is not good money. OK, so they want you to work with people. And if it's a broker that is not rated, all they have to do is have three to four. I think it's what is that? TBS uh, is that in this Internet trust stop. If you're a broker on Internet Truck Stop, all you have to do is have maybe five to six carriers uh, send you a recommendation saying that they ran your load, you paid them on time, and you didn't have any issues, okay? And they will give them a rating, okay, saying that, you know, you either paid within a 30-day limit or whatever the case may be. That's all you have to do as a broker. So if you're a broker and you're out there on a the DAT board or whatever the case may be, or you don't have a rating yet and factoring companies are not um, approving your uh, the carriers to run your freight, get you letters from your carriers that have ran your freight and say that you are a good broker and they will give you a rating. Also, for example, if I'm a broker and I'm not approved by TAF, let's just say TAF is the factoring company, okay? So TAF will say, hey, we're not going to run Brock uh, Logistics though because um, they're not, they don't have a credit limit. We don't know if they're going to pay or not. What I can do is I can give TAF my information. They will run me and they will give me a credit limit and they will say, hey, Tamara, I know you're just starting out. Give us some references, maybe okay, uh, that you pay. We'll give you a credit limit of twenty five thousand. So now, whenever a carrier wants to run my load and they factor through TAF or whatever the case may be, I already have established a twenty five dollar or fifty thousand dollar credit limit, so the carrier can run my load. Okay, so if you're having an issue with a smaller freight broker. Tell them to get in touch with your factoring company, do a credit check so that they can be approved to run, that you can run the loads, okay? So if it's OTR factoring company, as a broker, I can call OTR and say, hey, I'm a broker. I would like the carriers that use your factoring to um, be able to move my loads. Will you give me a credit check? Will you give me a credit? OK, so they usually give the broker that credit and say, hey, OK, we got to approve. But they have to be the ones to reach out. OK, either that way or um, they're going to have to be rated. And that's the hardest thing to do when you're a broker and you're trying to, you know, get business. That's why I say sometimes it's better to get your foot in the door as an agent, because if you're an agent and you're working for a big company, you have no issues, no problem. And if um, if you don't get paid. OK, um, you have, you know, legal ways that you can take it, but um, and you don't have to worry about because the brokerage that you work for is going to pay that 
pay, pay for that love. Okay, you don't have to worry. When I first started out, what I did was um, I did quick pay. And I didn't take out any funds. And but the 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 carrier had to trust me. Okay. Once I, I didn't wait on me getting the money from the shipper, I went ahead. If the load was a thousand dollars or whatever, they showed me proof of payment. I went ahead and paid them out cash. Okay. And then I waited on mine on the back end. And if you set up with com that and all you need for that is a route number and account number. OK, I had a, a load that I needed moved and um, and um, and 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 the shipper wasn't approved. OK, so what I did was I had the set up what is called cash on demand. OK, that means that when my driver uh, shows up to your location, you're going to pay them up front. OK, and. They're going to get half when they pick up the load and they're going to get half when they deliver it. OK, because you're not established as a shipper. We don't trust you on making your payments or whatever the case may be because you're a new shipper. So we're going to require you to pay me two hundred dollars. OK, whatever my fee is, as far as brokering this load for you, I'm going to require you to give me that directly when my. Uh, carrier shows up, I want you to pay him half up front um, uh, in good faith. And then when he delivers, I need you to pay him the other half. And usually it works out like that. And, and they're good. So we didn't go through a factoring company. We didn't do anything. Okay. We just made that agreement ourselves. Um, and if they need us again, we'll be there. We'll do the same thing. Hey, I need I need five hundred dollars for my fee, okay? And we're gonna do cash. We're gonna do that before uh, anybody picks up the load. That is due at the time of pickup. My driver is gonna come show up. I want you to give the driver half of it. If it's a uh, if it's a three thousand dollar load, I want you to give them fifteen hundred dollars up front. And when they deliver, you give them the other fifteen hundred before they unload. And we good, okay? All right. Any questions? Pay attention to sound business fundamentals. There are many successful freight brokers. Some have been around for quite a while. Others are just getting a good start. Of these successful brokers, each and every time most likely has relied upon sound business fundamentals. In fact, that's probably the very reason that they're success. It takes more than just brokering to be successful. It takes a person to purpose to pay attention to marketing, cash management, planning and creating operating blueprint. Okay. Uh, what's step four? Get set up with as many carriers as you can, regardless whether you have a load for them. Okay. When I set up with carriers, I set up with, if I'm focusing on drive in, I want to set up with maybe drive in and some reefer carriers. Okay. And I also want to set up the carriers where that shipper is. All right. So if I'm dealing with a shipper in Los Angeles, I want to get carriers that come out of Los Angeles. OK, it doesn't make any sense to get carriers that are based in Georgia to pick up loads in Los Angeles. You want to get your carriers close to your shipper. OK. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Internet, however, be prepared for things to go awry at all times. Being an agent, broker, dispatcher, this is not a nine to five position. Okay. You're going to have carriers that call you after hours. Okay. And they're going to need pickup numbers. They're going to get lost. They is something that may happen. And if you are an agent, a broker, a dispatcher, be able to be that communicator for that carrier. OK, um, the worst thing that they could happen is that they show up at a location and they don't have the right pickup number. They don't know uh, where they're going. Um, all those types of things. You want to be able to alleviate, alleviate the frustration and be able to handle it from point to finish. OK, because you want to keep this relationship going. You want to keep your relationship with your carrier. You want to keep your relationship with your shipper. You want to keep your relationship um, up to par on both ends. And answering that phone is one of them. 
Okay, we don't get off at five o'clock. If I have somebody I know that's on the load that may need me. Okay, I'm be able to answer my phone. This is my cell phone. If you have any problems, give me a call. Okay before a carrier gets upset and they just like you know i ain't staying here for this i ain't got this i just left okay um what else okay typical day in life uh, let's stop right here i'm going to go down to before i get off of here we're going to go on to terminology right because i told you that what we was going to talk about is terminology all right. Now, this is a cheat sheet that you will have when you are calling your shippers. OK, make you a cheat sheet. Here's a cheat sheet you can use in the beginning. You will find that you do not have to use this for long. Maybe not at all. The details you put on a low board should uh, have everything you know about this load with the exception of pricing okay so have your cheat sheet make your little sheet all right what you're going to want to know what's the commodity okay where is it picking up where is it going how many miles from the pickup to the destination okay when is the pickup date when is the delivery date is this going to be a repeat customer okay um how much does it weigh what is the length? Is it a 48, 53? Do they care? Okay. Um, you're going to ask what kind of truck they need. Do they need a reef of bed, a drive in a flat? Okay. Is it tarped or temperature? All right. You're going to confirm what's the shipping receiving hours? Can they, are they first come first serve? Um, are they open on weekends? Okay. You want to know what the delivery shipping hours and the rate. What are they offering you? Or what did you uh, suggest to them? Write that down. Okay. Uh, are there any extra stops? Okay. Are we doing five, six stops? Okay. Anything that you need to know on that load to make sure that you successfully deliver that load, uh, that that carrier can deliver that load to that location without any issues, you need to ask up front. OK, shippers hate that you calling them every five minutes. Oh, what did you say? Uh, what about uh, did you say uh, you could take a drive in? No, you get it all out. And usually they send that to you in the email to make it real easy. OK, and then you also going to put all of that on your what your rate confirmation. All right, let's get down to. Um, Let's get down to uh, terminology, okay? Because some of you don't even realize half the stuff I said because it's trucking ter terminology, okay? Um, let me see. Carriers, carriers. Let's go down to trucking terminology. Give me one second. I apologize. Uh, like I said, this is a huge book. Okay, here we go. Logistics terminology. Read it over and then Google. Okay, guys, before you even get on the phone, before you even start making calls to your shippers, especially if you're not in the transportation industry and you're coming from, you know, somewhere else and you're thinking about getting into brokering and being a freight agent, we must learn our terminologies. You must print this out, have it on your desk, put it in a, a binder or whatever the case may be, because when somebody says 3PL, you don't have a crazy look on your face like, what are you talking about? Okay. So you will know what these terminologies mean and you can use them interchange with what you're doing. OK, so if I tell you, hey, that's a 3PL, you may not be able to get that load. You can't say what is a 3PL. 3PL is third party logistic freight broker that offers partial or complete logistical management solutions for their customer. So what does that mean? That means if uh, Frito-Lay is a huge customer. They're a huge shipper, right? Frito-Lay doesn't want every broker calling them about loads. 
okay, when they got thousands of loads that go out all over the United States, okay? Somebody will be on the phone all day. Hey, you got any loads? Hey, you got, can you send me a load list? They got thousands of loads. They're not going to send you a load list, okay? So what they do is they hire people to do the logistical management of their loads. And that is a 3PL. They are a logistic freight broker, okay? They are in charge. They have power of attorney of Frito-Lay Lowe's, okay? They make an agreement with the 3PL, and the 3PL are the people that say, hey, I'm going to take care of your freight. I'm going to make sure all you got to do is focus on uh, producing the product, Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have warehouses. I'm going to have all these different places. I'm going to make contact with other brokers. I'm going to make contact with carriers. And I am going to be in management of moving your freight to make sure that it's picked up on time, that there's no problems, and it gets delivered. I'm going to also make sure that the broker is qualified and the carrier is qualified. So if Frito-Lay say, hey, I don't want anybody moving my product unless they have a million dollar insurance. That means that if you sign up with PepsiCo, okay, which is a 3PL for Frito-Lay, if you sign up with them, they're going to vet you and they're going to make sure that your insurance meets the qualification of their shipper they have been given the power of attorney to do so, right? All right. So then once that happens, you can do one or two things. Now, if PepsiCo is the broker, right? Listen to me carefully so we don't get uh, confused about double brokering. If PepsiCo is the 3PL, they the broker, right? And, but Frito-Lay is the shipper. And Frito-Lay says... I'm going to give you the power of attorney to broker this load out, okay, or give this load out. Then the 3PL becomes the shipper and they can give it out to other brokers. The brokers can give it to the carriers, okay? But if the 3PL is not owner of the product, they could own, and they are a broker, they can only give it to a carrier. OK, so that's why it's good to be a carrier and the broker. Why do I say that? Because if you can't get it as a broker, guess what? I can get it as a carrier. OK, so I can run there for it free. All right. Getting it as a broker means that I can give it to anybody that is a carrier that is signed on to me or approved by me. OK, getting it as a carrier means that. I completed the qualifications as a carrier and could get it directly. That's why you can get direct freight from the 3PL or even a shipper. Sometimes shippers like Walmart or 3PLs, Walmart's a brokerage too. Okay, they have brokerages too. So you could, but one requirement of their brokerage is that you have 12, 10 or 12 trucks. They own the freight, so they can decide if they could give it to a broker or they can give it to a carrier, okay? So if I'm calling and I'm looking for a load for um, 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 Rider Logistics, Rider is a brokerage company, they also a carrier, okay? So if I want a load from Rider and I'm a broker and a carrier, okay? So I call Rider and I say, hey, um, you know, we got these loads we need to move. I can't move it as a broker because they're the broker. What I can do is move it as a carrier, okay? Because we have a broker and a carrier agreement, all right? So that means that I have my own trucks, okay? That means that these people are either leased under me or I have some sort of ownership with them. OK, so when we're talking about um, um, who can move the freight, if I get if I'm a broker and somebody else is a broker, OK, and they call me and they say, well, Tamara, do you have any freight that I can move? And I say, yeah, I got some loads here. Let me give it to you. If you can move them, move them. OK, number one, I'm going to take a fee off the load that I got. Right. I give it to another broker. They're going to take a fee off of it. That's what it's called. Double brokering. You're watering down the freight. So by the time it gets to the carrier, 
Ain't nothing left. Okay. Does do people do that? Yes, they do it all the time. When does it become a problem? It becomes a problem when somebody don't get paid. It's illegal to do in the first place, but it becomes a problem when either somebody doesn't get paid or somebody has an accident, an incident. Okay. Because number one, if I got my freight from ABC Lumber Company, right? ABC Lumber Company said, Tamara, you can broker this freight out to carriers. That's one time. Okay. Any carrier that is signed up with you that passes the qualification, you can go ahead and get that freight out to the carrier. All right. So the shipper gave it to me. I put it on a low board and I give it to the carrier. The carrier calls in, they give me the MC number. I make sure that they have the proper credentials to run that freight and I give them a load. They sign the agreement, um, the rate confirmation, and we have a contract. Okay. So the, the carrier goes, picks up the load and they go deliver it. They turn me in a proof of, of delivery, which is called the bill elated. And it's signed saying it was delivered on this, that, or the third date. Okay. Once they do that, I get it and I pay them. Right. Thank you, Mr. Carrier, Miss Carrier, for uh, delivering that load on time and no problems. Here's your money. Okay. Whatever we negotiate. Now, we're not going to have the same negotiate as I have with the shipper. I may negotiate that load for $4,000 with the shipper, okay? And I may give it to the carrier for $3,500, okay? Where the other $500 goes? That's my fee for negotiating the load, okay? So I give it for the carrier, $3,500. He, he shows me a BOL, a proof of delivery. I send him $3,500, okay? Now, I turn around and I wait on my money from the shipper and the shipper is going to send me four thousand dollars okay so the 35 went to the carrier 500 stayed with me everybody's happy all right then we live to see another day okay now if you do the double program eventually one of the two things going to get happen soon as that carrier has an accident a problem and uh, there's going to be an insurance claim or whatever the case may be, a refusal of product, the shipper is going to say to you this. All right, let me have your, the carrier's um, uh, information. So if they're your own trucks, you will have insurance and all that kind of stuff on it. So if you don't gave this load away twice, okay, that's going to be the issue. And it's going to cause a problem with insurance, okay? And it will put in the, in the shipper says, I didn't give that load to ABC brokerage. I gave it to you. Okay. And you turned around and you gave it to somebody else. It's going to get you in a world of trouble. Do not do that as a broker and as an agent. And a lot of times we lose customers. Okay. Because we don't know how to broker the freight correctly. Okay. There's plenty of freight out there. You don't have to, as an agent, I'm a freight agent, right? I could go on the board and I could pick C.H. Robinson load. I could pick Ryder load. I could pick anybody load I want to. When I get that load, my truck is showing up. Okay? You got to make sure. That's why we say what is brokerable and what's non-brokerable. Okay? So if I picked a load from FedEx and FedEx has a contract with um, um, the company or whatever the case may be, they're expecting their trucks, my trucks to show up. Okay? So it can be a little bit, but if you keep it simple, you won't get in trouble. Okay. If you keep it simple, you won't get in trouble. Okay. If you're an agent and you do something like that, you're putting a brokerage in trouble. If you have your own brokerage, you're putting your own license in trouble. Don't do that because if you get a claim and, 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 and they come after you and that claim is not paid, it's just going to be out of business quick. Okay. People are going to be suing people. All right, let's get back to transportation terminology. 3PL. We got 3PL. Agent. A ACH. Y'all know that. That's your electronic payment system, how you get paid, okay? Um, agent. What does the agent do? Agent is a person who writes a freight, okay? Um, transportation of goods under the authority of a licensed freight broker, okay? 
Um, so if you're a freight agent, there is a brokerage or somebody that has a license that you work under that is responsible for you. OK, what is the API? API's application program and interface is a method used to send and receive data between computer system or BI web. OK, this can be like with your tender process, because when you're dealing with loads with Tyson and you're dealing with big company loads or even with PepsiCo. They're not going to send me a load list, okay? I'm going to go into their system with a login and a password, and I'm going to be able to see all their loads. And we're going to be able to transfer paperwork back and forth via the web, okay? What is the authority? Authority grants the legal permission issued by the FMCSA to transport or arrange for the transportation of goods or passengers. So you will have a carrier authority that transport the freight, and you will have a broker authority that um, um, assists with the transportation of freight. Okay. And you also have a freight forwarder authority. Backload a load that will return a motor carrier to the home domicile. Bill of lading. This is what we learn. Okay. Bill of lading is a legal document issued by the carrier as proof that the shipment has been received from the shipper by the carrier uh, for ultimate delivery to the consignee, okay? When you go and pick up a load, they're going to give you a bill of lading, okay? Um, we don't give out bills of lading because you pick that up with when you go pick up the load. We give out what is called a rate confirmation, telling you everything about the load. OK, how much it weighs, the pickup numbers, all those different. Our contract is a rate confirmation. The bill of laden, of laden is a legal document. And what it does, it has the weight on there. It has the product on there. It tells you where you're going. It tells you it could be in detail and it, it has a bill of laden number on it. And this is what the carrier is going to receive from the shipper. They're going to take it over to the uh, receiver. The receiver is going to sign off on it and they are going to turn it in. They are saying, hey, I received this product. It was intact. There's nothing missing, damaged or broken. I sign off on it and now um, the carrier wants to get paid. Okay. So that's what the BOL is. When you get pulled over by DOT, a lot of times they're going to want to know what you're carrying. You always need to have this BOL whenever you're carrying freight. Okay. I put mine in the dash so that you can reach it with your hands. So if anybody asks for it, okay. Uh, DOT is allowed to open your freight. If they have any questions about what you're carrying, then they can open your freight and they will have a seal and it will say open by DOT and they will put that on your bill on your bill of laden. Okay. That DOT inspected this freight, you receive it and they don't have an issue with you. Okay. But that seal on that, um, on the, it will have also your seal, but that seal on there should not be tampered with until you get to the shipper. Okay. Learn about your 8485 security bonds. That is, if you're going to be a broker, you will get this. The three main things that you need to become a licensed freight broker is one, you're going to have to have your um, BOC3, which is an agent process of about $25. Okay. You're going to have your authority. OK, which is by the FMCSA, that's going to cost you three hundred dollars. OK, then the last thing that you're going to need to be a license is going to have your either your BL, BMC 8485. OK, this is just like your insurance, like what a, a carrier has uh, when they are signing up for insurance. The three things that make a carrier legal to run is going to be the BOC3, their insurance and they're signing up with the FMCSA. OK. Authority is going to be your BM8485, your BOC3, and the authority, FMS, FMCSA authority, okay? That pretty much will make you active, all right? Break bulk, CFR, um, common carrier, what is the consignee, the person that receives the freight, container freight, auto liability, cargo liability, OK, general liability. This is what I call contingent cargo. If you are a broker, it is very good to have contingent 
Cargo is an insurance policy for brokers that cover physical loss and damage to cargo. In the event the carrier's insurance failed to acknowledge the claim. So when you're working with big companies um, and their, their claims is a lot of money and it's expensive and you working with this carrier that you thought had the insurance to cover it and they don't have the insurance to cover it or they deny it, they're going to come back and look at, hey, they got to get some money from somewhere. So we're going to require you to have what is called contingent cargo to cover my cargo. Okay. And usually it could be up to three, $300,000. It's going to cost you about 150,000, I mean, $150,000 a month. Okay. So have a $300,000 uh, cargo liability. Okay. So if the carrier, if the carrier insurance is always first. Okay. The carrier insurance is always first. The broker's insurance is going to be second. All right. It's a backup. Contract carrier, uh, deadhead, y'all know about that. Uh, drayage, driving, EDI, EDI. I talk about this. Electronic data interchange used to pass electronic data from one computer system to another. When you're working with a lot of nodes, sometimes they have what is called EDI systems, and it's easy for the shipper to put in what loads they need moved, what time they need moved, and everybody can see the information and we all exchange it and we get the freight picked up, okay? Express codes, um, when you're authorizing payments, like for a lumper or whatever the case may be, okay? But these are some um, um, freight classifications. Sometimes you have to work with that with a shipper when they don't know how to classify their freight, and that's a whole other uh show okay freight forwarder freight broker carrier that takes physical possession of the cargo at some point during the transit okay that means when it comes from overseas and it comes to the united states the freight forwarder will take possession of the freight and make sure it gets to the point of delivery okay fuel surcharge gross maximum weight vehicle weight hazmat okay that's another uh realm that you can go to into is hazmat freight okay you got to make sure that you got all the paperwork with hazmat you cannot have your carry out there with the wrong paperwork they will get ticketed fined and can't go to jail okay with hazmat so you got to make sure that you know you have to be hazmat certified okay don't just be trying to go after hazmat customers and thinking you uh, special and you're just going to move hazmat freight. No, you need to take the training for moving hazmat freight to make sure that you do it correctly. All right. Uh, ICC, intermodal, interstate, interstate, intrastate. Remember, interstate is one state to another, which most of us got. If we leave it out of Georgia and we go to Alabama, we have interstate commerce, okay? That's the question that everybody, when they're filling out for their authority, am I interstate or intrastate? If you're moving from one state to another, you are interstate. If you are only in one state, if you're only staying in Georgia, you are intrastate, and you only have to have a U.S. DOT number. You don't have to have an MC number. You still have to be insured, but you ha only have to have a U.S. DOT number. If you're doing interstate, you have to have an MC number as well. All right. Line haul rate. That's the basic rate of the freight. OK, that is the basic rate of the freight. You have your line haul rate. When you see um, when you go work for a company and they say 65 percent of the line haul, that is the base rate. OK, they cannot take or not supposed to take off of your accessible rate, which is anything that's added that the driver has to do outside of its normal duties, such as fuel. OK, nobody should be taking off your fuel if they're giving you a fuel surcharge. Um, tarpon, that's the work that you do. So nobody should be taking no money off your tar tarpon. That's totally the driver's. Um, what else can you think of? Tarping, uh, fuel, uh, stops. If you're making additional stops, okay, nobody should be taking extra money for that. 
Okay, that should go to your carrier, your driver. Okay, so anything outside of the base rate, base rate is what it will take for that driver to get from point A to point B. What's the rate for that? Okay, and if you leased on, you're probably like at 65, 75% of that, but everything else should be at 100%. Okay, the low board, the low board is like that internet truck stops. There's some free low boards out there. And what they do is they put all, you You have a database that puts all of those from different brokerages and shippers and everything in one place. You pay a fee and you can look and see what's in your area and you can call and contact the broker and book the load. Okay. LTL, less than truckload, that's partial shipments such as pallets of goods that do not require a semi-trailer. Sometimes you could put those loads on box trucks, okay? Lumper is what it is to pay, okay? Reefa has a lot of lumper fees, okay? Um, what it is to pay an independent person to unload the truck, okay? That's called a lumper fee. OK, so um, you have to make sure that you include that in your rate when you are rating your customer. OK, uh, OSND, overshore and damage. You know, uh, you do not leave your sh shipper unless you report. Hey, William, you do not leave your shipper unless you report if you have a over shortage or damage. So you do not get blamed for the freight. You report it at the shipper. They acknowledge it. You get in touch with the broker. The broker gets in touch with the shipper and they will let you know what you would need to do with that. Okay. Throw it away. They don't care. Toss it, whatever. It's up to you, but do report it so that you don't get charged for it. Okay. Owner operator is a person who owns and operates their own semi truck. Okay. Which people can debate about all day. It doesn't matter. Uh, proof of delivery, which is going to be a signed BOL showing that you came, you delivered, you conquered, there was no problems, and you want to get paid. Okay? Power unit. Um, um, what we call that? Uh, PO, uh, power only? That's what we do. PO, power only. Um, it's just a semi truck. We carry somebody else's trailer. Anybody trailer. Okay? And what we would get is what is called interchange. Did I pass the H I interchange insurance? Okay, trailer insurance uh, to carry somebody else's trailer, so that if we mess it up with something, we got insurance, we could pay for it. All right, reefer temperature control, reefer trailer SAT code. Okay, if you're a broker, you are required to get a SAT code. This is by the National Motor Freight Traffic Association, okay? And it gives you a code, like, um, what is uh, JB Hunt? JBHT, you have a four-digit code, okay? That will, if you got containers or whatever, it it shows that this container may left the country, it comes back in and all that kind of stuff. You can read into that. All right, and uh, stop-offs, tears, weight. So all these things you need to study and make sure that you are familiar with it before you start making calls. All right. Uh, an hour and 33 minutes. Do anyone, we're going to come back and we're going to go, I'm going to do this, I don't know, whenever I feel like it, I guess. But we're going to start working on how we set up with our emails um, what we do on LinkedIn, we're going to talk about um, what kind of paperwork that you need to have to ship to send out to your uh, shippers that you're trying to get. Okay, how we look for customers. We're going to do that. We're going. I'm going to do it on live feed. Okay, so if it's on YouTube, if it's on Facebook, if it's in a group or whatever the case may be, you can always go back and look and study um, about. The certain things that we do as brokers, carriers, dispatchers, and agents. All right. Um, any questions before I get ready to get up out of here? What time is it? It's almost three o'clock. Uh, any questions that you may have before I get out of here? Did I bore everybody to sleep? No. 
Do you like talking about this stuff or no? Y'all really acting like my class now. Y'all don't say nothing. Uh, is it is it overwhelming? Do you understand it? I mean, if you're in a trucking business, you you understand it. But is it something that's helpful? Thank you, Denise. You know, you ain't had to pay five hundred dollars, right? Soak it in. You know, this is what we talk about. Hey, Jason. Thank you, Jason. YouTube is awake over there. So um, take this information, use it as a benefit to uh, enhance your knowledge. Uh, no, just a refresher for me. Okay, to en enhance your knowledge. Even if you're driving a truck, you may get want to get in some of these specialty uh, trailers. Okay, you may want to want to change. Thank you. I appreciate you. You know, it's not for a lot of people. You know, I don't expect, you know, there'd be 300, 500 people <laughs> in, in the live feeds. But I do expect the ones that want to learn and want to be more knowledgeable about what agents do, what brokers do, even as a carrier. OK, you don't have to be uh, all of this to learn, to have knowledge. You know, even as a driver, if you move into this point and it's someday, one day you may want to do this, it's very good to know, right? Let's get to business. One thing someone cannot take away from you is your knowledge and soak it up. Just soak it up. Be a sponge. That's all I ask. Okay. But we'll get into um, where is Ripley? uh ripley is gone he, he is out he's at home so but yeah he's not with me because when he comes up here he's so good like he doesn't you know say anything he's um he'll be laying down or whatever the only time that he'll he will bark is if somebody like come knock on that door or anything like that but if you walk by or whatever the case you won't even notice him. he's here but I'll bring him. I'll bring him up. What's the day? Friday. I'll bring him up Monday. He has to go to the doctor Monday. Got to get his shots and stuff like that. But other than that, oh, did I tell y'all on a personal note? Um, I'm gonna be a a grandmother. Did y'all get the news? Our Sean, I don't know if he's still in here, is expecting a child. Okay, so I will soon be a grandmother. So that has a whole lot of more, uh, other responsibilities as well, right? All right. So if you want to be able to look at, you know, this manual or whatever the case may be, it is located in the mentor group, okay? Um, and you can review this uh, as you wish. We're going to talk about our carrier packets for those of you that are being brokers. We're going to look at how we find our shippers. We're going to make some calls. Y'all want to see me make calls? We'll make calls and um, and go from there. And if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask them in here. And I'll be more because whatever your question is, somebody else may have the same question, right? So we can. Um, Get it out the way and answer it here. But it's three o'clock and um, almost three o'clock and I got to go. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace, love, joy and happiness. You all have a wonderful and blessed day. Bye.